Hello all. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming down here tonight. I know some of you have uh, come down as far as Scotland, so uh, it, it's a great, uh, a great honour to have you here. Now, a lot of people have been complaining that we talk too much in British Freedom about the Islamic uh, factor, but we have to talk about it because it really is the most important thing that this country is going to be facing in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And we have to face it, because if we don't, we simply won't be here in 15, 20 years' time. And this is, uh, this is not up for debate, this is an absolute fact. And there's a guy called uh, James Burnham who wrote a book uh, back in the 60s, and he talked about uh, warfare and the point of warfare and it's not about storming beaches, it's not about uh, it, it blitzkrieging uh, across Europe. The point of war is only one thing, and that is to get political control over territory. And what we're seeing in this country now is Sharia political control incrementally taking over traditional British law, traditional <laughs> British culture. And they're doing it in a way that is... Uh, it's very dangerous because it's slow, but it's steady, and it's growing all the time. <coughs> and we see this recently with uh, the case of Darren Conway, who's been jailed for a year for putting up pictures of Muhammad in his windows of his house, and a few pictures of some EDL demonstrations. Now, apparently, this offended local Muslim people. And we're not allowed to offend them because under Sharia law, you cannot offend Muslims. So this guy has now gone to jail for 12 months for offending Muslims. We saw the same thing with uh, David Jones. I don't know if you're all aware of David Jones is the guy that did the uh, Fireman Sam uh, books. I haven't seen them myself, but apparently he's quite high profile. Now he's going through Gatwick Airport. <coughs> And a woman, a Muslim woman in a veil, walks through security in front of him and doesn't remove her veil. He makes a tiny little remark, supposing I wore a veil and I came through here, what would you do then? He was promptly taken to one side, questioned by the security services. They called the police. The policeman that came up said, you're not allowed to say these things because times have changed. We live in a different country now. Now, this Sharia law effectively means you are not allowed to criticize Islam. Now, this guy didn't even criticize Islam. He merely offended a Muslim woman who was there at the time. Now, this creeping Sharia is something we should be really concerned about because we're not allowed to be offended. You know, when Muslims burn poppies on Remembrance Sunday in this country, now, quite frankly, I am extremely offended by this, but there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't walk up to the local policeman and say, I feel very offended by this because he won't take any notice <coughs> of you because you're not the right race, religion, color, whatever you want to call it. You are simply a second class citizen in your own country. The Somali girl gang that beat up a, a white girl and, uh, and her boyfriend. He wasn't much of a, a boyfriend from what I could see, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe he had a few drinks, I think, uh, I think he probably had. But they kicked her around the floor and they said, we're going to kill the white bitch. Now that, under all of our new laws that have come in in the last decade under race and religious uh, hatred uh, laws, now that is immediately indictable. No, they should have been arrested, they should have been tried. Well, they were arrested, but the judge uh, who tried them excused them because as Muslims, they were not used to drinking, and because they were drunk, they were, they were then allowed to walk free from the court. And this is coming down from on high, you know, this is a... Uh, uh, we now have the Supreme Court in this country, which we didn't used to have. This is a European Union uh, edict again. And the, uh, the, the, the Supreme uh, Court leader is a guy called uh, Lord Nicholas Phillips. 
And Lord Nicholas Phillips actually came out two or three years ago and said, Sharia law is permissible in this country legally as long as it doesn't inflict serious physical harm. And this is coming from the guy who is the top of our legal uh, profession, the top of our court system in this country. And this, again, is incremental creeping Sharia. You know, it's uh, unbelievable, really. And this is coming down even higher up than the European Union. This, you know, this comes from, uh, from the United Nations. And the United Nations... Uh, has within it 57 member states of an organization uh, uh, called the Organization of the Islamic Conference. And they have Saudi money, they have Qatari money, they have, uh, they have Abu Dhabi money. And they are now the people who have the largest bloc vote in the United Nations. And the United Nations basically do as they're told by them. So when you have someone like Ban Ki-moon, who was the uh, Secretary General, uh, came out over the Fitna, the Gert Wilders uh, video a few, uh, few years ago, a couple of years ago. And he declared Fitna uh, to be a hate video. Why? Why is Fitna a hate video? All Wilders did in this video was put little clips together of various Muslims and Imams saying we want to take over the West, we want to do this, we want to stone women, we want to... Uh, he, yeah. bring in the, uh, the new <coughs> caliphate. All he did was put these things together, but there was not a single instance of any person in those videos being tried, being prosecuted, not one. The only person that was prosecuted was Wilders for simply putting into the public domain what these people were saying. Now, this, again, is basically Sharia. You are not allowed to criticize Islam. By putting it out in the public domain, he was criticizing Islam. Therefore, under the United Nations, which do not really, you know, from my point of view, exist to serve the Muslim countries, but now they do. And it goes down lower again from there, down to the European Union. Now, the, uh, the founding documents of the of the EU Constitution make no mention of the fact that our pillars that built the European people, the culture, the countries, into what they are today, one of those founding pillars was Christianity. And I'm not a religious person, but you cannot argue that the Europe that we live in today is a Europe that was not formed by Christianity. You can't argue against this, but in the EU Constitution, no mention of it at all. What they do talk about, of course, is Islam. They talk about Islam a great deal. They want to bring in the Euro-Mediterranean Alliance, which will bring in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and they want to bring this into the European Union. So we all live in this great big, happy, multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, family. But we can't criticize them. Again, Sharia law, we cannot criticize them. There was a 2006 uh, directive that came out from the European Union, which only mentioned one religion again, and that religion was Islam. Not Christianity, only Islam. Not, uh, not Zoroastrianism, not, uh, not Buddhism, only Islam. And they have now an organization uh, called the Monitoring Center Against Racism and Xenophobia. Now, we know what that means. If you speak out against Islam, you will be prosecuted for inciting racial or religious hatred. But only against Islam, not against anything else. And then they bring in the European arrest warrant. So no matter where you actually say anything critical about Islam, I could say something in Germany uh, next week, and a German could, uh, could uh, notify the German police. I will come back to the UK, but I can actually be extradited to Germany to stand trial for criticizing Islam. And while that is going on in this country, we have people like Abu Qatada, who can say what they like about taking over this country, but under the UN uh, uh, Human Rights Act, he will not be extradited. 
I can be extradited for criticising, he cannot. And this, again, is incremental creeping Sharia. I'm not allowed to say anything. They can say what they like. It's, it, it, it is Sharia law. And this really was fast-tracked by, uh, by the Labour government. You know, when the Labour government came in, they did two things immediately that essentially put the, the future of this country into, into jeopardy. Uh, they brought in the, uh, the, the uh, Human Rights Act, and they opened the doors to mass immigration. And when these millions of people came in from all around the third world, obviously not all of them uh, were bad people, but amongst them there were, there were terrorists, there were paedophiles, there were criminals, and once they came in under these new labour immigration laws, they also were not able to be thrown out again because of the European uh, Court of Human Rights laws. So this made it a, a, a haven for people that wanted to basically overthrow our country. They were invited in, they can say what they like, and there's absolutely nothing that we could do about it. Again, creeping Sharia. And the Labour government went even further than that. They started taking people into the, uh, into the civil service. Derek Pasquale, I don't know if you've uh, heard of Derek Pasquale, he was, he was sacked from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office a few years ago. And the reason he was sacked is because he was essentially a whistleblower. He came out and he said the Foreign Office ha has been taken over by Islamic radicals and it's now essentially a front for the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the, the Labour government sacked him. They didn't take him to court because if he'd gone to court, he would then have stood up there and said exactly what these people were doing in the Foreign Office. Now, that would have been very embarrassing for the Labour government, so they simply sacked him, told him to bugger off, and that was that. Nothing else happened after that. And, uh, a well-known journalist called Martin Bright wrote a 90-page a uh, thesis on this called uh, When Progressives Treat with Reactionaries, which was essentially talking about uh, uh, liberals like Tony Blair who are being used and taken advantage of by reactionary people, you know, i.e. liberals get fleeced by uh, extremists. Now, this should have been something that was picked up on by the mainstream media, by the BBC, although obviously not the BBC, but it should have been. And it wasn't. And again, this is, uh, this is something where a well-known journalist is talking about a very serious situation where the, the Foreign Office has been taken over by Islamic radicals and this is not deemed to be newsworthy. This is an astonishing situation in this country today. It, it, impossible to think of happening 15, 20, 30 years ago, but now it happens routinely all the time. Labour government also uh, set up the Muslim Council of Britain. Now, the Muslim Council of Britain, again, is linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood want to bring in, they want to install a global caliphate they're serious about it. They've been working on this for decades, you know, 40, 50 years. You know, Hassan al Banna set this up in Egypt uh, just after the Second World War. They're serious about it. And we see them now in, in, uh, in the Middle East today taking over the so-called uh, uh, Arab Spring that is rapidly descending into what I would term a uh, Quranic winter. And the media over here are still wittering on about how we're going to bring democracy to the Middle East and how they're going to... They're not going to bring democracy to the Middle East. They don't want democracy in the Middle East. They've never had democracy in the Middle East. Sharia law does not take into account democracy. It's insane. And it's a typical example of liberal politicians living in a multicultural society which we now are hoping for the best and all it, that's what it is you know it's hope they simply hope that's what's going to happen and they let it go even further again the labor government polygamy in the in the in sharia law well in in, in quranic law they have a, an expression called jizya and jizya is when the 
uh, the non-Muslim infidel has to pay tax to the Muslim overlord. Now, we're paying jizya right now today because we are taxpayers. 75% of Muslim women in this country don't work. 50% of Muslim men don't work, but they can have four wives. We can't have four wives. As far as I know, bigamy is still uh, seven years in jail if you're found guilty. But what, uh, what they did, they said, listen, if we marry our wives outside of, uh, of uh, Britain and then bring them in, that gets around that law. Now, that's fine. They can do that. But what we have done or what the Labour government did, they actually financially rewarded it. They said, yes, you can have four wives. You don't have to go to work. We will pay for your welfare, for your housing, for your education, for your health. We'll do all of these things whilst they go to the madrasas and the mosques where they are indoctrinated into essentially overthrowing the liberal democracy that is providing them with the means for them to do this. We're paying for it. This is jizya. This is something that is Quranically uh, uh, set down. And we're doing it. If you're a taxpayer, right now today, you are paying jizya to the Muslim overlords. The Labour government also banned the blasphemy laws. They repealed the blasphemy laws. And they did this because the blasphemy laws particularly applied to only one religion, to Christianity. So therefore they had to go because they were discriminatory. But then they brought in the new laws, the 2006 uh, religious hatred law, and we all know why they bought that law in. They bought that law in because Nick Griffin, the BNP Nick Griffin, uh, said at a, uh, in a speech that uh, at some point in the near future, Muslim terrorists are going to, to blow something up to kill somebody, and they will come within a 20-mile radius of where I'm making this speech. And a few weeks later, we had the, uh, the 2005 uh, London transport bombings. So he was right, he was correct. But he was still taken to court over it. And his defense, of course, was, listen, Islam is not uh, a race, it's a religion. So the government brought in a new law about religious hatred, hoping to get him on that. And meanwhile, the blasphemy laws had been repealed because they only uh, centered on Christianity. But the new law that came in and the only reason it came in was because you are not allowed to criticize Islam. Again, this is creeping incremental Sharia. Archbishop Rowan Williams, God bless him. <laughs> Here he is, he's actually come out, the, the, the main man in the English church has come out and said, yeah, you know, Sharia law's fine, Sharia law's okay. You know, we can't possibly allow these people to come in and take away all of their rights. So you put some of those things together and, and you start seeing the, the, the slippery slope that, uh, that, that creeping Sharia is. And then we have David Cameron. I don't know if anybody here voted for David Cameron thinking he was going to make this country any better. <coughs> I know some people did, but they're very disappointed now. But the, but the Muslim Council of Britain is still in existence. It's still doing exactly what it was doing in the old days. It still has its links to the Muslim Brotherhood. Exactly the same thing. And unite against fascism. I'm hoping we haven't got any, any of them in here tonight. Obviously, we did a good job earlier on. But uh, Cameron is a a founding signatory to Unite Against Fascism. And Unite Against Fascism recently had uh, a, a new vice chair appointed, a chap called Mr. Azad Ali. And Azad Ali is actually linked to Al-Qaeda. He's one of these guys after 9-11 that said uh, what the BBC said, you know, thank God America got a bloody nose. Azad Ali was out there on the forefront whipping this sort of stuff up, and he is now sitting on an organization which is essentially there to stop people like me and people like you attending venues like this. And Cameron is 
on their side. Why did anybody think Cameron was going to actually do anything about the Islamic question in this country? I have, I have no idea. He also wants Turkey to join the European Union. There are 80 million people in Turkey. 80 million. They will then have the biggest bloc vote after Germany in the European Union. And of course, they're very, very poor. The, uh, the gates will be open. How many Turks will come over here? God only knows, but uh, they thought 17,000 Poles would come here. <laughs> so what have we got now? Two million, three million, five million, I don't know. But we are going to get, if, they, if, they get the, if the Conservatives get their way, they will let Turkey join the European Union and we will have millions of Turks coming into this country, continuing what they are still doing. And don't forget the Turkish Prime Minister said there is no such thing as moderate Islam and integration is a sin. And Cameron wants these people from this country to come here. The Conservatives are a joke. And Andrew Gilligan in the, in the Daily Telegraph was uh, writing recently about this. Cameron is still funding organizations like Hizbut Tahir, Tahrir, if I can pronounce it correctly, which again is uh, linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. They uh, again want to, want to inflict this global caliphate upon our democracy here. And they are being given hundreds of thousands of pounds from the taxpayer. I go back to this jizya question again. We are paying for these people to overthrow us and our government apparently is complicit in this. It's astonishing. And they won't do anything about it. You know, the last election, Cameron's main sort of claim to defence on this is that he can't do what he wants to do because his hands are tied by, uh, by the Liberal Democrats. But the only reason he does not have a majority uh, uh, rule in this country now is because there was fraudulent Muslim uh, voting in the last election and Baroness Varsi came out and said the only reason the Conservatives lost the last election was basically from three seats and those three seats were Muslim seats they had a huge amount of election uh, postal electoral vote fraud going on so Cameron's government only exists today in its weakened state because of Muslim voting fraud in this country. That again should have been a huge story. Varsi came out and said this. She was invited on to question time the, the night after she said it, but apparently she had a cold, so she couldn't go. Now, obviously that was uh, uh, something from on high. Don't go out there, don't talk about it, don't mention it, because this is not something we want the general population of this country to know. So the, so the the government today is basically, as far as I'm concerned, the government today is complicit in allowing creeping Sharia law to, to go further in this country. And all the institutions are the same. So take the police force. Before the, uh, before the London bombings, we had uh, Commissioner uh, Ian Blair, who was very, very political, and he came out and said, uh, there is nothing wrong with being an Islamic fundamentalist. There's nothing wrong with being an Islamic fundamentalist. And he knew when he said that, that there was all this stuff going on all around the world where Islamic fundamentalists were blowing people up, were bl burning down Christian churches in Egypt. He still came out and said this. And it got worse than that. The day after the London bombings, Brian Paddock, the assistant commissioner, came out and said, Islam and terrorism are two words that don't go together. And this was the day after 52 people were murdered in our city and 700 were made. And this guy goes out the day after and says something like this. But the police have been taken over, you know. They now study the Quran. They study Sharia law. And they do this because they want to interact better in the interests of community cohesion. Our police force that should be out there protecting us are essentially doing what Islam wants them to do. And they really are. You know, they have to notify mosques before they go in there. The Finsbury Park Mosque had an arms stash in it. They had, you know, uh, this was Abu Hamza back in his day. They had arms. They had weapons in there. 
And when the police raided it, they were told they could not raid it immediately. They had to notify the mosque before they did so. When they went in, they had to take their shoes and socks off. And if they had police dogs able to sniff out explosives, dogs are unclean, according to Islam, so the dogs had to have these little special little rubber booties on their feet before they were allowed into Finsbury Park Mosque to look to see if they had explosives in there to blow us up. This is insane. And it's not just down here. Up, you know, up in Scotland, there's a, a West Lothian. I'm going to have to read this to you because I can't, uh, I can't remember the entire quote. But there's an inspector, Tom Galbraith, of the West Lothian uh, Police Force, who said, uh, who said, if I have a young Asian man who's been subjected to, never a Muslim, always an Asian. If I have a young Asian man who's been subjected to a hate crime, I would rather put more resources into that than it have than if it had happened to a white male, because the white male is far less likely to end up becoming radicalised. So what the police are saying here essentially is that if you promise violence, you will be rewarded by the police. They will go out of their way to make sure that you are treated preferentially than poor little white people like us who are the victims in all of this, but we're not allowed to say anything unless we back it up with violence but we don't back it up with violence, so therefore, again, we become second-class people in our own country. True. So violence works. And we saw what happened with the police after uh, the Channel 4 undercover mosques. Imams on the filmed undercover, filmed there saying, throw homosexuals off cliffs, take over number 10 Downing Street, overthrow the infidel. That's sedition. It's also homophobic. Ah, da, 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 possibly racist because we're all, uh, some of us anyway in this country are still white but uh, what happened after that no imams were prosecuted not a single one not one, the only people that were prosecuted were the actual producers of Channel 4 themselves by West Midlands Police Force who were the most politically correct anti-English pro-Islamic police force in this country today not coincidentally, there is a large Muslim co uh, 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 population in the West Midlands. So it seems that whenever you have a large Muslim population, everybody from our establishment gets on their knees in front of you. It's, again, Sharia law. We're not allowed to do things they are. Accept it. You are all in this room second-class citizens in your own country because of what is going on today with Islam, which is why I talk about Islam more than perhaps I should. <clears throat> and it goes down to education. You know, schools today, not all of them, but some schools today, no longer teach the Holocaust because what the Muslim kids are learning in the local madrasas and the mosques is the Holocaust never happened. So in order not to upset their sensibilities and in, in order to ensure what the police call a community cohesion, uh, they're not taught about it. Nor are they taught about the Crusades, because the Crusades, again, run counter to what these little Muslim kids are taught in the mosques and in the madrasas. The worst thing, I don't know if anyone here actually knows this, this uh, came up a few years ago, under the uh, uh, school curriculum, the national curriculum, if you're a non-Muslim teacher and you are uh, teaching religious knowledge lessons and you have to handle the Quran, you are not allowed to put your uh, bare hands on the Quran as an infidel. You have to wear rubber gloves before you take the Quran out and show it to the children. Rubber gloves because you are a filthy pig-like infidel in England today. Can you believe this? And it's part of the national curriculum. And one thing that these children were taught to recite as part of this was there is, a, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Now this is called the Shahada. If you want to convert to Islam, the only words you need to say are those words from the Shahada. And that is the only expression from the Quran that English children are taught to recite and to write down. 
Why? Why? What is going on in our schools? It's money. It comes down to money again. Huge amounts of money is being poured in from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, and this stuff is, is permeating down. BBC have a thing called a bite-sized revision program uh, on the... <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, not on the television, but on the on their website, and they had a thing. I actually got it closed down about four years ago, and it was the most disgusting, uh, racist, vicious, bigoted stuff I've ever seen in my life. And it it, it talked about uh, uh, Christianity and Islam, and it guided these small, unformed children's minds into only one direction, which was. Christianity is imperialistic, it's oppressive, it's racist, and it's sexist. Islam is a female-friendly, multicultural, <laughs> one, uh, ad, da, 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 da. religion of peace. Religion of peace, exactly. But the way that they, the way that they steered these children's minds into this was uh, was like something from from communist Russia. You know, it was uh, it it was. It, it, subtle yet incredibly efficient in what it was doing and what it was doing was again enforcing Sharia onto our children in our country at an age where they don't know any better which was utterly immoral we, uh, we did a little story on this and we got people to phone up the BBC and to write them letters and they eventually changed it but you know you have to you have to work hard to get the BBC uh, to change anything. But uh, that was one little victory that we had. And they are typical of the media, you know, the NUJ guidelines, National Union of Journalists guidelines. Again, are influenced not by the best interests of us, but the best interests of people who've come to this country who don't particularly wish us well. And NUJ guidelines actually say that if you are a right-wing organization, and of course we are, I think I'm a central political person myself, but according to the BBC, I'm obviously far right, but they go out of their way in the NUJ to say that uh, far right organizations should not be given the oxygen of publicity. In other words, whatever they do, ignore them. Unless, of course, you want to do them damage in which case go out of your way to do them damage. And this is why we, we see so little of what we should be seeing. You know, if you want to know what's going on in this country with uh, Islam, what's happening to us, you cannot read the media, you cannot watch the TV, you have to look at the websites, because the media have essentially been taken over. Again, I don't know if they've been paid off. I have no idea why they're like they are that they are like they are, and they will clamp down completely on what we would like to say. And the BBC, again, for example, has, uh, has the Bayland report. Now, they spent millions of pounds hushing up the Bayland report, and this was a report they commissioned themselves, and it was based around, are they, uh, they anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian? And this guy, I assume he was called Bayland, uh, made the report, it clearly came down on the fact that, in actual fact, yes, the BBC was biased. So rather than put this out into the public domain, they just, uh, they just shut it down. And then when they were told to release it, they went to court to stop it coming out. After 9-11, we had question time. And the BBC filled the entire audience, not the entire audience, I'm exaggerating, they filled the audience with a, an over-representation of Muslims who eventually uh, uh, made the, 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 uh, the poor American ambassador, they reduced him to tears with their, with their sheer hatred of the West and hatred of America. And this was just a few days after 9-11. And the BBC wanted this to happen. They wanted the world to see that America uh, was, uh, was, the, was the bully and Islam was the victim and America got what was coming to it. The BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. You know, Mark Thompson, of course, is the Director General. He's come out and said that uh, they will treat Islam more sensitively than any other religion. 
Now, if you watch people like Stephen Fry sneering about Christianity, you know, you know that they're not too concerned about uh, religion per se. They are only concerned about Islam. And when he says we're going to treat it more sensitively, he said this about a year ago, but he's now come out and said, well, the reason we do this is because if we don't, they might come round and blow us up. <laughs> so, again, here we are. They are getting their way because the institutions of this country, even if they don't want to go this way, are going on this sort of creeping Sharia because they're frightened of them. You know, terror and civilized approach. You know, you know these are these are these well-spoken Muslims. They get onto 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 to Question Time and Newsnight, and they all sound terribly nice. But what they're doing. They're working in conjunction with terrorism because they know that terrorism by itself can't work. Being civilized again by itself can't work. You put the two together and you are almost unbeatable. And at the moment they are, you know, they are unbeatable. What they're doing right now is it, they're winning. I go back to this thing about uh, uh, warfare and uh, the fact that it's essentially political control over territory. Now, if you lose your media, your police force, your government, and your education to people who are anti you, your culture, your religion, your country, those are battles. And they're all battles that we're losing. And we're losing the battles because we refuse to accept that Islam is at war with us. Islam knows it's at war with us, and that's why we're losing the battles. And until we wake up and we say, we understand you're at war with us, and we are going to mount a defence, and now we are mounting a defence. This room tonight is the beginning of mounting a defence. And we have to do it. We have to do it because there's three million Muslims in this country, and they are effectively controlling our political sphere. In 10 years' time, there will be 6 million. In 20 years' time, 12 million. In 30 years' time, 24 million. We have to win. This is a small start. Thank you all so much for coming here tonight. And let's start winning some battles. frankly, I am extremely offended by this. But there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't walk up to the local policeman and say, I feel very offended by this because he won't take any notice <coughs> of you because you're not the right race, religion, colour, whatever you want to call it. You are simply a second class citizen in your own country. The Somali girl gang that beat up a, a white girl and, uh, and her boyfriend. He wasn't much of a, a boyfriend from what I could see, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe he had a few drinks, I think, uh, I think he probably had. But they kicked her around the floor and they said, we're gonna kill the white bitch. Now that, under all of our new laws that have come in in the last decade under race and religious uh, hatred uh, laws, now that is immediately Indictable. No, they should have been arrested. They should have been tried. Well, they were arrested. But the judge uh, who tried them excused them because, as Muslims, they were not used to drinking, and because they were drunk, they were they were then allowed to walk free from the court. And this is coming down from on high. You know, this is a. Uh, uh, we now have the Supreme Court in this country which we didn't used to have. This is a European Union uh, edict again. And the, uh, the, the, the Supreme uh, Court leader is a guy called uh, Lord Nicholas Phillips. And Lord Nicholas Phillips actually came out two or three years ago and said, Sharia law is permissible in this country legally as long as it doesn't inflict serious physical harm. And this is coming from the guy who is the top of our legal 
uh, profession, the top of our court system in this country. And this again is <coughs> incremental creeping Sharia. You know, it's uh, unbelievable, really. And this is coming down even higher up than the European Union. This, you know, this comes from uh, from the United Nations and the Europe. The point of war is only one thing, and that is to get political control over territory. And what we're seeing in this country now is Sharia political control incrementally taking over traditional British law, traditional British culture. And they're doing it in a way that is uh, it's very dangerous because it's slow, but it's steady, and it's growing all the time. And we see this recently with uh, the case of Darren Conway, who's been jailed for a year for putting up pictures of Muhammad in his windows of his house and a few pictures of some EDL demonstrations. Now, apparently, this offended local Muslim people. And we're not allowed to offend them because under Sharia law, you cannot offend Muslims. So this guy has now gone to jail for 12 months for offending Muslims. We saw the same thing with uh, David Jones. I don't know if you're all aware of David Jones is the guy that did the uh, Fireman Sam uh, books. I haven't seen them myself, but apparently he's quite high profile. Now he's going through Gatwick Airport and a woman, a Muslim woman in a veil walks through security in front of him and doesn't remove her veil. He makes a tiny little remark Supposing I wore a veil and I came through here, what would you do then? He was promptly taken to one side, questioned by the security services. They called the police. The policeman that came up said, you're not allowed to say these things because times have changed. We live in a different country now. Now, this Sharia law effectively means you are not allowed to criticize Islam. <laughs> Now, this guy didn't even criticize Islam. He merely offended a Muslim woman who was there at the time. Now, this creeping Sharia is something we should be really concerned about because we're not allowed to be offended. You know, when Muslims burn poppies on Remembrance Sunday in this country, now, quite... Hello all. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming down here tonight. I know some of you have uh, come down as far as Scotland, so uh, it, it's a great, uh, a great honour to have you here. Now, a lot of people have been complaining that we talk too much in British Freedom about the Islamic uh, factor, but we have to talk about it because it really is the most important thing that this country is going to be facing in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And we have to face it, because if we don't, we simply won't be here in 15, 20 years' time. And this is, uh, this is not up for debate, this is an absolute fact. And there's a guy called uh, James Burnham who wrote a book uh, back in the 60s, and he talked about uh, warfare and the point of warfare and it's not about storming beaches, it's not about uh, it, it blitzkrieging uh, across 